Hi, this is Sandy Bear. We're back with what's happening after a long, too long hiatus. With me today is Graham Clark, um, a former principal and an educator, still an educator, of course, in the state of Vermont, and Kurt Maida, an attorney in both Vermont and New Jersey. And the three of us are very interested and have been for quite some time in Cuba and what's going on in Cuba. So we're here today to talk about what is happening with all of there have been recurring protests in Cuba against the government of the Republic of Cuba and also pro-government. So we're here today to talk about somewhat about what's happening in Cuba today. And that is a story that has not uh, been covered hugely by the mainstream press, but we think it's very important. And so here today is Kurt and Graham and me to talk about Cuba today. Okay, so Kurt, you're the person who has had the most to say <laughs> in many ways about Cuba, so what's going on? Right, so I mean, I think what has been actually covered by the mainstream press, Sandy, is that, uh, that there were massive protests in, in Cuba on July 11th, and uh, these protests were in, uh, with respect to the fuel shortage in Cuba, the food shortage in Cuba, the fact that the Cuban government actually developed an indigenous vaccine, five of them, as a five. matter of fact. Uh, and the, you know, the first non-large industrial country to do such and has been unable to distribute these vaccines because of lack of uh, vaccine-related paraphernalia that uh, has significantly limited their ability to distribute the vaccine to the people. So numbers of COVID infections have skyrocketed, and that's created a great deal of, uh, you know, so, discontent right. on the mm -hmm. streets. Crazy. Uh, it all as started to that day why, after my waitress uh, there's shift. A lockdown still in place. I was the running for government down there had originally said that by the end of August, the entire island would be vaccinated and back in business and open and free and maskless and open to tourists. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem to be happening because of, because of the shortage of syringes and other medical items. And it's created some frustration in on the streets in Cuba. Now, what's interesting is that was seen on the United States as well as Western European television sets and internet as a, um, a total frustration with the Cuban government right. and a weak Cuban government and a Cuban government that was about to collapse and that's been the narrative that we've largely seen mm -hmm. here, whether it's in New York Times editorials, whether it's uh, comments made by politicians from the mayor of Miami, all the way up to the president of the United right. States. And I think what we, I think, wanted to have today is a, is a discussion about the fact that these protests, as authentic and as real as they appeared uh, on, on American television sets, uh, there was some coordin ex external coordination and um, support that has not really been discussed in magazines and newspapers as esteemed as the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal in this mm -hmm. country. And that's partly what, you know, what we want to discuss. Mm -hmm. The fact that the, this campaign uh, in Cuba was not completely spontaneous. Independent. Or Mm -hmm. And not just that, that, that it was actually financed mm -hmm. by external interests. Now, whether those external interests are the U.S. government or if they're independent organizations, you know, history will tell us what that is. There are allegations out there, but we don't know for sure who was responsible. But the fact that, you know, a government, uh, you know, to support Cuban critics, uh, uh, critics of Cuba, of um, of how that society is run, Cuba is a tightly controlled country in terms of its uh, its. Music. And the fact that a spontaneous protest can start up in 40 cities, and the Cuban government would not know any uh, anything about this in advance, is highly unlikely if there weren't external uh, reasons and and uh, causes for that. Uh, so that's that's something that's that's important to, you know, to for people to know that are that are watching. Yeah, Graham, do you have any? Yeah, Cam? couple couple things. Um, so forty cities, and it seems like there's common agreement that the, that was 
unprecedented in the last right. several decades. Yeah. Um, I'm just, you use the word massive. Can you put, um, how many people were in Havana are, okay, are so they saying? Great point, Graham. So interesting thing is the, the way it's been mentioned in our press and much of the European and international press is that you would think that there were thousands upon hundreds of thousands of people on the street. The reality is, the actual count of guns several hundred Many of the, of the t cities outside of Havana, we're talking about less than 100 people were out in protest. What was actually done, many of the people that we saw that appeared as if there were hundreds of thousands and millions of people on the streets, was uh, there were images of protests in Egypt that had taken place a few years ago. How do you know ago. that? Is that? How did you find that out? That's something that The Guardian has actually, The okay. Guardian newspaper has actually reported that. The uh, Guardian, that's in English. That's right, it's a yeah. British, it's yeah, a British, British publication, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, as well as celebrations in Argentina for some soccer match. And that was often used photos of what transpired on July 11th. Another thing so. was wow. that the current president of Cuba, Castro Diaz right. Canal, Miguel right. Diaz Canal, yeah. uh, asked the Cuban people who were supporting the government to come out and put out a show, uh, put on a show, and show that, you know, yeah, hey, so we're still supporting the government, and let's see if it shows up. And something like 200,000 people came out to say that we're frustrated with what's happening, but we're not trying to discard this government and the society that we have. And what happened is in a lot of American mainstream media presentations of those protests in favor of the government, yeah. supporting the government, they failed to provide context and show that these were pro-government protesters. Uh, the, the current government. So besides the protests, you know, like we're kind of going back to the uh, discussion of uh, the size of the Trump inauguration, you know, okay, who's there? How many people were there? But this into making people think that there's widespread. Did they muddle it or did they deceive us? scenario you can make <laughs> say that you know they simply didn't provide the context of who was out on the streets and who were they supporting and who were they against and <laughs> the crowd up here people all trying we're against the government and calling for it down okay and that they're not afraid anymore and then they essentially want this government to collapse and that's the way it's been portrayed in the press as well as, you know, with well, many politicians, as I mentioned set. before, from, you know, mayors to <laughs> Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Exactly. Since COVID, yeah. an acceleration of shortages throughout the island. If you will, but right. also... Um, yes. And, and some medicines. That's, right. And that started, Graham, that started a little bit. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. Based on, you know, based on the so right. yeah. And then what it appears now is the Biden administration, you know, ha having been handed the baton right. of being tough on Cuba. So hey, we, I, had, we, you know, we, we had a group of um, 20 Burlington educators in, in Havana, um, April of 2019. And right. So with, with with so many things, but certainly with Cuba, there there are so many things, facts that can be true. It it right. It was an unprecedented event. It, it did have larger people come out, um, much smaller than reported, and um, Cuba has done a pretty remarkable job. It seems it, while. Their um, vaccines have not been, um, all, all the literature has been submitted to the international scientific community. It seems like those vaccines 
uh, are up to about 28% of the country. So they were looking right. to get 70% by the end of this month. Right. right. That was the um, objective. So there, you know, the, the mainstream press will talk about, you know, the incredible vaccine shortages in Cuba. Right. And, and you look around the Caribbean and, well, and Cuba is in the, uh, one of the top countries absolutely. administering a vaccine. For, for a, a non-developed uh, yeah. Western country, uh, what the reality, you know, if you take countries in Asia and Africa as well as the rest of the Caribbean, mm -hmm. uh, I think they account for something like one percent of the population of these places has received, have received right. the vaccine. But, uh, but that, although that's uh, good figures, yeah. but I want to explore a little bit with why has the United States always been so interested, essentially, in regime change? in Cuba, and this is another kind of example. In other words, the United States has always taken the position that it is the right, in a way, of the United States to interfere with Cuban politics and destroy that regime, and that did not alter after the death of the Castros, or the- uh, uh, Fidel Castro. Uh, uh, Fidel right. Castro, right, and then Raul is still alive, but he's supposedly no longer in charge. He's not the, he's in not charge the president. Of, but, right. but, however, the press still refers to Cuba Cuban government as the Castro. Right, or world. the communist or whatever, right. And it gives the United States the absolute excuse to operate with impunity in right. Cuba, which I is mean, what I've always, I mean, what I've always felt about Cuba is that the United States should be friendly to its neighbors and sure. that we should be supporting the Cuban people regardless of what government it is. And the United States has always taken the position of making Cuban lives miserable. Right. I mean, I mean the, the, our, our current president right now has made a statement after the July 11th events, uh, um, being careful with what I call them. Some people call them protests, other people mm -hmm. call them riots. In Cuba, cars were overturned, uh, rocks wow. were thrown, shops were looted. Now, you know, you, you have to look at the context, you know, on the right and the left in our country, you know, what we call things. You yes, know. of course. On the left, people call the January 6th, in, quote unquote, insurrection, right. an insurrection right. and a riot. Uh, and they'll call the Black Lives Matter protests. Right, quote, right. Protests, mm -hmm. and right. the right will call them riots. Right. Because shops were looted and there was, there was actual violence on the streets. Right. Uh, so the events that took place on July 11th in Cuba were, um, were, were not precedented in, in that country. And uh, they have been, t you know, they have been portrayed as an attempt to try to bring the government down mm -hmm. there. And our president, our current president right now, has talked about being with the Cuban people. Right. However, in terms of trying to ameliorate the conditions right. for the average Cuban person on the street, it doesn't appear that our policies are in line with being with the Cuban people when it comes to food, when it comes to the fact that medications for the treatment of cancer, forget about COVID, for children, right, right. Uh, cannot, be ex cannot be sent to that country. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so how is that being with the Cuban people? Okay, so maybe we should talk about that. Uh, under uh, President Obama, the sort of the uh, narrative was is that he opened relations with Cuba. He made right. Cuban lives uh, much better. And in fact, he did. He, he at least recognized Cuba as a legitimate country, and we began to have diplomatic relations yeah, with Cuba. It appeared that there was a new path. Yeah, there was, was a new being, opening. I've you know. always commended President Obama about that. Because, and I happen to think largely it's because President Obama probably recognizes Cuba not only as a poor country in, in need of our help, but also a fairly uh, diverse country and right. largely people of color. And right. I think I think Obama had sympathy for yeah. that, However, as all of us should gonna, have. I, I yeah. do want to, you know, yeah, I, give right. you a, a nuanced opinion even about Obama. All right. You know, part of what what transpired on July 11th was it showed the power of social media yes. as a new exactly. weapon exactly. of war right. in right. countries, and that's what. If there was any coordination that took place, it was through social media. Yep. Now, who was yes. behind that social media campaign? You know, we can talk about that during for the, a little bit of the time that we have, but. Even during the Obama administration, there were attempts, yep. for, you yes. know, even prior to his administration, of expanding internet accessibility right. on that island from an exter exterior right. source. And still are. And still are. Right. And 
that has been part of the you know the, right. the, the dialogue even under under the Biden administration. How do we flood that, that, that country? That is the dialogue. Yeah. How do we flood that Biden country with more internet? Exactly. Exactly. And uh, you know, if you go back to the Alan Gross arrest yes, yes. in Cuba, which you, which uh, needs Alan, some explanation. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, so Alan Gross was a contractor for U.S. Aid, USAID, mm -hmm. uh, and he was arrested in Cuba for distributing satellite equipment right. to expand internet. Now, before you go into Cuba, you know you know there are certain things you shouldn't bring in. Right. Satellite equipment is one of those things. You know, pornography, uh, uh, narcotic drugs, illegal narcotic drugs, and a, and a host of other things. However, knowing that, he still went in and did that, and he was caught and he was arrested mm -hmm. and spent time in jail. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, time. Yeah, a fair amount of time. Mm -hmm. And our Senator Leahy was instrumental in having him a prisoner exchange, prisoner exchange, right. and released right. Right. to, right. to right. the United right. States. And he has got nothing uh, decent to say about Cuba. Also, Alan Gross. Right. Yeah, maybe the food. It, but, uh, yeah. Right. But then, uh, then there was another program under the Obama administration. It was called Zanzaneo. And what it was was it was basically creating a Twitter-like platform in Spanish down in Cuba that would originally start out as being focused on music and dancing and people meeting one another. Mm -hmm. And the objective was later to then transition that into a a, a political mechanism. Yeah, like Voice of America or something, right? right? But on the right. ground in Cuba, yeah, in right. Spanish, mm -hmm. to then create a uh, a situation where a mob can be directed and protests can be started in that country. But wow. then the, the the process was shelved in 2012. Now this is right square in the middle, you know, of the Obama presidency. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, the objective was always to have that country change. Yeah, sure. It's always yeah. been regime change. However, I think it was using soft power under the Obama administration through dialogue. Uh, but there's always yeah, been- Yeah, carrots a, rather than a stick. Than a stick which, approach, right, right, right. 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 Yeah. But, but it's the never changed, you're right. The objective has always been to right. try to get rid of a socialist society right. in, you know, Cuba. Right. in the Western Hemisphere. Right, exactly. You know, citing the, the, exactly. the Monroe Doctrine. Well, can, yeah, go ahead. Can no. we um, talk about two things that we, during the Obama years, there was the um, United Nations uh, vote on the 60-year-old sanctions against, yeah, right. uh, embargo, embargo yeah. mm -hmm. against Cuba. Right. Um, again, there was a, a vote two, a month ago or so right. recently. It was it true that during the Obama uh, years, yes. there was one vote where the United States in the UN voted to um, abstain. They, they they actually abstained in the they vote. Abstained. Abstained. They didn't vote. No, no. but that was right. a huge victory for Cuba. Right. That broke precedent. That broke precedent. And I right. think, if I'm not mistaken, I could be mistaken, but it was the same year, perhaps, that Obama visited Cuba yeah. and, and met yeah. with I went uh, to the Raul baseball Castro, game. With Raul Castro. Mm -hmm. So I think it would have been that was poor the year form. They had Obama. Right. The Pope and the Stones. And the Rolling Stones, right. yeah. Right. yeah the and it, it, the seemed, it yeah. really did seem like a brand new day. And But I agree with you. The policy toward Cuba, but not only toward Cuba, toward all of Latin America has always been the same, which is to not have any socialist regime, mm -hmm. or I would call it a government, a socialist government, in all of Latin America, in the West, period. In the, entire Western in the West, hemisphere. well, yeah, pretty much true. all over the world. Oh, right, right. All over the yeah, world, as yeah. a result of the Cold War. Sure. It's always been Cold War politics. Can you talk but but a especially bit? now, I mean, given the fact that we have, you know, whether you want to call them good relations or poor relations, we do have relations with with China. We do have relations yeah. with Vietnam. We have to with China. <laughs> right, with China, we do have to, but right. we do have relations with Vietnam, despite right. a bloody conflict that right, we were involved right. in for a long time, where a lot I of know. Our, People on both sides were killed. I, I know. Don't remind me. I right. Know, it's just... But uh, but with Cuba, it's it's a different story. Right. And there, yeah. I think there are reasons for that. But you wanted to say something. Yeah. I did. Yeah. What what I wanted to say is, escapes me. But uh, um, there was in the U.S. press, you hear about the embargo, and there's, you know, uh, it doesn't impact medicines. It doesn't impact food. Right. Um, you're talking. You're, and, and you're, you're saying, well, it's, not really. It's simply not true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, the shortages, the shortages on the ground that you see in Cuba are largely related to things like food, things like fuel, uh, and, and medicines. And, you know, the, what's interesting is people always will talk to me that, you know, have a, a, 
a slight familiarity with Cuba, not a whole lot, mm -hmm. but they'll say, well, why don't they just get those things from the rest of the world? You know, it is the Cuban government that's poor and inefficient because, you know, we're right. one, one country. And what people don't often realize is there's a principle behind the embargo, which is called extraterritoriality, if I said that right. And uh, what that means is the, what, what makes the, the, the embargo really biting, the U.S. embargo, Quick. is the fact that other countries, if other countries traded with Cuba mm -hmm. in, let's yeah. say, product X, yep. that country would be then excluded from the American market. So Volkswagen, Siemens, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, a, a British company, uh, if, if they sold their products to Cuba, they would have to basically forego the American market. And that's, so that's a right. tough business decision to make. And we've seen make. so much in the last 18 months, the interdependence in the global relationships of, of the economy of course. relative but that, to, of you course. know. But that's critical, because that, yes. that's why the Cubans call the embargo the blockade. It's a, block, it's a virtual blockade. It's a blockade, yeah. right. And so there, you know, I've, I've had lots of people, including people that are friends of ours, who say, well, you know, it is the inept, incompetent government could be, except that how could any tiny island withstand that kind of economic pressure? Mm -hmm. I'm surprised, really I'm always surprised at the resistance of Cuba to, to remain true to itself and be able to even survive right. in it's this a, world. It's, it's so a, a, a non-industrialized non country mm -hmm. that right. you know, relies heavily on receiving products from abroad, even many items of food right. from abroad. Including rice abroad. from Vietnam. Right, so right, right now, um, there's a, a significant shortage of syringes in Cuba right. uh, to administer the vaccines, which are three shot vaccines. Correct. So you They're the need, same? You need 33% uh, yeah. more syringes in Cuba than you would in the United States. Uh -huh. Correct. Um, correct. Not including, yeah, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. And sure. Correct. Yeah. And I'm not sure, uh, Sandy or Kurt, how the program works, but uh, is, is it possible to put a tagline in for um, information relative to the number of organizations in the United States that are working, um, is it Global Health Partners, who's fundraised for, I think they've already delivered well, 400,000 syringes yeah, it's, it's okay, okay, and you know, you, yes, I, I think it's all right to talk about humanitarian efforts to help the Cuban people, and that's what you're really talking about. Yes. But I want to get to something before that, because there are other countries that have offered help to Cuba, and it's critical to understand that, because there are other countries. There was a brilliant little sentence in the consortium article today. It's poor countries helping poor people. Poor countries are going to Cuba. Cuba's assistance, which I think is really like heartbreaking in a way that the richest country on earth mm -hmm. is making Cuban people miserable while other poor countries are trying to help Cuba, which is a poor country like Nicaragua. Did Can, you see that today? Right. So Nicaragua is, you know, uh, while we're talking about creating some... Uh, screwing a, Cuba. A, a naval right, flotilla please. that was going to mm -hmm. set sail from Miami to surround Cuba. Uh, the, is that the, right? Yes, yes, and it didn't amount to much. A bunch of ships were going to cross the Florida Ships Straits. that were what, private yeah, navies? Private, pri no, yeah. no, pri okay. private vessels, yeah. Yeah, private okay. vessels. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, as Sandy mentioned, uh, the government of Nicaragua. Uh, a poor country, too. A very poor country right. under very similar, you know, difficult situations, but not, I mean, situation, but not nearly as bad as Cuba. Uh, they're sending supplies. Mexico has so sent sending supplies. supplies yeah. has Did you sent Vietnam has been. Yes. Uh, China. Yep. Yeah. Russia. Ru Russia has sent uh, some supplies, including a million masks and some other medical products uh, to to help the country. So maybe at the end of the show, we could um, share some information. Yeah. If you in have print. it. Right. Uh, I don't have it off the top of my head about the organizations that are doing well, the syringe. Um, yeah, but I also campaign. I also want to say that, as far as I know, under the current regulations. Okay, let me let me just say something else. Um, was it, Obama did relax some travel to Cuba. He mm -hmm. made it really pretty easy to go to Cuba to bring money to Cuba. They were called remittances to send money to the Cuban uh, people. He made all of that a whole lot easier, which, boy, I really commended him for that at the time. But when President Trump came into office, it was again to buckle down Cuba to uh, the whole policy of regime change came back in force. Not that it didn't really 
ever go away. Ever go away, but it yeah. did at least, mm -hmm. it opened up humanitarian right. aid to Cuba on, a, on basically a one-to-one -one level, but Trump made all of that worse. He disallowed now remittances from family to family. It, the Cuban economy was basically based on, Cu on Cuban families here sending money to their relatives in Cuba. He said no, or he reduced the amount, correct? That's, yeah, okay. yes, it reduced so the amount. So he reduced the amount. And, and they're saying that that amount, so, do it's you, a major do, portion of the economy. It's a major does portion of the Does anyone know any immigrant group that does not send money back to their none, families none. worldwide? None. And no, and, 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 it has been going right. on for centuries. It happens in every it hap country. Look, it happens. Are you kidding? And, it is the basis for, right. uh, for many and, third world countries. And, and, and right. it's not just money, Graham. It's not just money being sent. It's what's done with that money. And right. people actually invest, you know, mm -hmm. in creating Airbnbs as the tourist sector is very important. People fix up restaurants there so that they can serve tourists. So it's not it's not just, you know, essentially giving the poor man a, right. a, a piece of fish. It is sort of giving them, you know, uh, fishing lessons. So in April of 2019, we're yeah. in an Airbnb right. and uh, Armando Villaseca took us to the um, Francisco who we were staying with. Yeah. His grandson had just opened up this phenomenal bakery. Yeah. And it was... Was it the French bakery? It was, yeah, a collaboration. He had a, a friend in the States who he had worked with around ingredients and, and whatnot. So your your point is well taken. That yeah, I mean, the objective sometimes is to make them... Just, right. And it's up to... Um, so they're saying that the remittances that went two years ago, so Trump didn't cut that down until his second or third year. I don't remember, but Close he cut to it a billion down, dollars, which is, it, which 700 is, yes, which is million a, to a billion dollars is not going into Cuba, right. the people's hands. Right, and again, you know, you've got to remember that we're talking about a small population, an island. So this Th is these an are island. big numbers. Uh, yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And Biden just, again, uh, kept that in place. And right. Biden the has, Cuban been governments, doing... you know, taking some money will say. No, they, they charge yeah. for, for American as dollars, does, of As course. does Western Union. Yeah, to as does everybody. Yeah. As does everyone. Yeah. You know, yeah. Any, as any as international everyone. travel Correct. I've done, right. you know, when you exchange money, there's a commission. Always. Yeah. Right. But, yeah. But, it, but I really want to stress that. So at a time of COVID, of course, it increased. When COVID broke out and the pandemic broke out, Cuba found itself locked down from tourism. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, even though Trump had also basically exploited Cuba and hurt Cuba, so did the pandemic, because then tourists couldn't go either. But so I, I want to get behind, you know, another point. I mean, is it because Trump or Biden, for that matter, really care that much about Cuba? Yes. No, no. I think it's about domestic politics in the United States. Yeah, some. And the importance of Florida yep. in that calculation. Yeah, but you're asking two different things. Yes, to those particular politicians and to the politics of the United States, Florida has always been key. Correct. Okay, and the Florida yes, vote, absolutely. which is, and we should talk about Florida because that's where a lot Certainly. where the anti-Cuban sentiment comes from. But there's something else that goes on. Historically, the United States has always, through the Monroe Doctrine, wanted to have complete control over all of Latin America. Right. Yes. Over it all, South America, Central America, the Caribbean, Canada, and the United States. Although Canada is, well, I won't go there. We but. do have a military base on the soil. Yes, and that's Cuba. really right. important, and I want to talk to you after that. Guantanamo the United Bay. States in 1904 and after the Spanish-American War took control over Cuba and established a naval base there, which is still there. It is sure. the U.S. naval base. So it's not just and during these. The, right, and during the... Uh, the creation of the uh, co uh, the Constitution of Cuba at the time, after they achieved independence from right. Spain, we actually pushed a a amendment to their Correct. constitution, referred to as the Platt Amendment, right. after a U.S. senator right. named, named after a U.S. senator, that basically tells Cuba to understand that uh, in the event that anything were to happen on the island that could adversely impact American interests. The United States essentially had the right to intervene right. militarily, even if, if necessary, in, on the island for, any, for anything right. that needed to be done, including the change of a, a government or an administration. Correct. So that has been longstanding, really since 1898, that yes. ever since Cuba supposedly got independent from Spain. Okay, it's also been true in Puerto Rico, too. I mean, that's when the United States took 
Puerto Rico and the Philippines and, sure. and on and on, when it basically defeated the Spanish Empire. So it's nothing new, although it's an additional twist, because when Cubans left the island after the revolution, largely white people and sure. rich people, correct? Yes. In 59. Yeah, a, a lot of professionals disproportionate. You know, uh, but it was uh, also racist. I mean, it was white people who left. Right. It wasn't black people. And, and they were coming to an America at that time where segregation was the law of the land. Yes. Still. Correct. Right. But they, but they came here with the idea always of going back after right. the communists were defeated. Um, and those play into the politics of Florida, as you mentioned. Right. In fact, I heard really rather a horrifying thing in the news that the Miami mayor, I don't know which political party he is, was actually saying that Bi Biden was, should bomb Havana. Right. So These are people's relatives. He's, yeah, right. He's a, did he say that? I mean, did you hear that? Yes. Yeah. Well, he suggested that. Yeah, air. That, that airstrikes commence against. Okay, against. so the, but this the was Cuban a week after um, he saw a gigantic building in his city collapse and right. Right. kill hundreds of people. So right. he was acutely aware of what happens what, what, when, when, poor, when, when buildings poor fall. building infrastructure right. can and, be you know uh, impacted. Yeah, I, and I, I think as important as Florida is to to the equation. Uh, if the Democrats continue to win and never win Florida. They'll it, never win it, Florida. It, it, it won't make any difference no. because this, what we're talking about certainly goes way back into right. the 1800s right. and the 1900s right. and sure. not just Florida becoming important in the last But I think what quarter, Sandy mentioned, quarter, this is century. just the newest twist yes, now. That but, there, become, but there is that twist because after 1959, oh, yeah. all these rich Cubans Largely white Cubans came to this country, and that's the politics of Florida. There are other politics of Florida, of course. I'm not meaning to totally uh, condone, uh, condemn Florida by any means. But that is each party wants to win the Florida vote. Right. Mm -hmm. Every, each party, because it's so crucial, right? Then, you know, then the other interesting thing is, you know, aside from Florida as a factor uh, in, <laughs> in the current US, you know, policy of our government, is whether or not, you know, so the, the the July 11th event, mm -hmm. uh, it's been referred to by some people, you know, uh, in, a, in a kind of in a comical way, as we recall the Bay of Pigs invasion. Yes, I see. Yeah, they call it yeah, the Bay yeah. of Tweets because this oh. was largely social media driven. Uh -huh. And uh, whether or not this was essentially a policy like Kennedy took from Eisenhower that perhaps Biden took from, from the Trump administration in that uh, it doesn't really have much to do with Florida politics. This was a handover of a policy. Right. Biden right. ran when he ran f uh, f for the office of the presidency. Talked about returning to the Bo the Obama right, administration's tactics with respect to Cuba. Suddenly, after he was elected, uh, there was silence uh, about what the policy with respect to Cuba was going to be. And when, all the way through July 10th. Correct. Right. Correct. There was absolute silence, and then when uh, his foreign policy establishment was asked uh, what is going to be the Cuban policy because they have explained what the policy was going to be with respect to other countries. Sort of. Uh, sort of. Uh, and if it were going to change. And they were met with silence. And, and in, essentially the response was at this point Cuba is not a high priority in the foreign policy objectives and goals of the country. And so there wasn't much said about that at all about Cuba. And we go from that to then what took place on July 11th, and then it seems like we have a firm policy, which was to not only, yeah, which was not only to maintain the 243 measures that Trump took against the country, but to add to that, and to ask for individualized sanctions on different individuals that are part of the Cuban government. Mm -hmm. We only have a couple of minutes, um, but I, and I wanted to mention one thing, but then I want to you know, tell, have you talk about those organizations. And that is that according to the consortium article today, there's an interesting though, shift in foreign policy that's also occurring around Cuba, and that is Cuba is getting very important allies, which is gonna really bother the United States because the, the nations that have been helping Cuba are nations which really also will, could, um, affect the United States hegemony in the world, right? Isn't there seem this to, just a return in 1960 all over again? I don't know. What do you mean? Well, I mean, when, you know, when the United States and Cuba, you know, traded tit-for-tat sanctions against one another, 
it basically opened the door for the Soviet Union. Yes, well, to come uh, right. In. Okay, uh, okay. So that article points out this growing alliance between Russia, China, Nicaragua, Venezuela, um, Iran, and Iran, because yeah. Iran is and now Vietnam. selling oil, and Vietnam, and Iran is and that to produce produce the, the vaccines. Cuban vaccines, the Cuban, the Cuban produced vaccines. vaccines. This is important. This is really, really important. Anyway, for Cuba, but also for everybody in the world, it would seem. Okay, but Graham, you want to mention some organizations that might be delivering. Yes, which I, I don't have off the top of my head, so. But we uh, could also talk about the Cuban American Friendship Society, which is determined yes. to do. Um, I would invite anyone to just Google Cuba vaccine campaigns, and um, I think Global Health Partners is, is, do you remember that name of the yes. organization? In the United States, that's uh, probably has the largest campaign going and and many members uh, of the Cuban American Friendship Society and, and Vermont uh, citizens have been donating uh, you know to to those various we have all, the Cuban American Friendship Society since the 90s have been having humanitarian and educational trips to Cuba I would hope that we could do that again soon to deliver humanitarian aid that's always been legal right, right? so mm -hmm. For, well, I'm going to ask both of you folks, as members of the Cuban American Friendship Society, mm -hmm. can Americans donate money? We're looking into that. Right. Right. To you know, I, towards, believe, I don't know what Cuba. I was thinking. Maybe and not violate the embargo. We're going to try. I would never do anything illegal. Right. I'm a lawyer, so I have to be real careful. Careful, but we are looking into what is possible and what isn't, and. Okay. Uh, and I believe that humanitarian aid is still possible, and they need it. Right. And they really need it. So with that, thank you for joining us on Cuba Today and on what's happening, and see you in a month or so. Bye.